I've been a nerd and home automation enthusiast for a long time, and last year I bought my first house, which gave me the opportunity of a lifetime. I was finally going to be able to put everything I'd learned about smart homes into practice, and I set out to build the best dang smart home that ever was. For over a year now, I've been documenting that journey on this YouTube channel, letting you know all the devices, technologies, and automations that I'm using, and how they're all set up. The problem with these videos though, and with all the usual content like this that you get on YouTube, is that it's a point in time perspective, and you don't really know how the decisions I've made and the devices I've chosen stand up over a long period of time. And let's face it, a home is something you're spending a lot of time in. It doesn't matter if it's smart or not, so you want to make sure that things are going to perform after years of use. So in this video, I'm going to go back over the key smart home decisions that I made with the benefit of hindsight and highlight some of the best choices I've made and some of the worst. If you want to know more information about any of these original decisions or setups, then check out the deep dive videos that are in the playlist linked below. One of the most foundational decisions I made early on was to build a solid smart home network. This involved installing a comms rack in my laundry room, which is where the existing services like electricity, network, audio and TV cabling were originally run to. I terminated all my network cables into this rack, installed a unified Dream Machine Pro and PoE switch, as well as a home-built rack mount server running Proxmox. I then had my electricians run extra Cat6 network cabling so that I could install Unify Wi-Fi access points throughout the house and some of their CCTV cameras. I then posted a quick follow-up video where I recabled my rack based on some feedback that my viewers gave me, and this whole network foundation has been one of the best decisions I've ever made. And fingers crossed, so far it being in a laundry hasn't caused any problems with the humidity, temperature or vibrations. Now this networking equipment and the electricians to run new Cat6 cabling weren't cheap, but I believe it was worth the investment. My network has performed without missing a single beat. We get gigabit each way internet to our desktop and work computers which are hardwired into the network, and we get strong Wi-Fi signal in every corner of the house. I've never seen a work video call or 4K Netflix show ever do any buffering, and it's never gone offline unexpectedly. A few of the YouTube commenters told me I should have run Cat7 cabling or fiber optics throughout the house, but that would have cost way more money for a very small improvement in real world performance. It may have future-proofed my house for a little longer, but Cat6 is capable of running 10 gigabit network connections, which is probably going to be fine for the next 5 or 10 years or more. One thing I do regret though is not running more data cabling. I should have got the electricians to run two cables everywhere instead of one, so I can plug more things in and power them via PoE. It's now too late to rip open the walls again to run more cables, but luckily I have solid Wi-Fi which I can rely on for any new smart devices. Another thing I probably would have done differently is to better understand the power consumption of these networking devices, and seeing if there was some way I could get similar performance with lower power usage. The rack is currently pulling about 210 watts of power, and that contributes to half of my house's baseload energy usage. This is a big power drain, but I think it's worth it for all the benefits I get from it. Using Proxmox on my home server has been a solid choice as well, but honestly it's no better or worse than my existing Docker setup. It's been fun to learn more about virtualization, but either option is honestly a great choice for a smart home if you have a strong IT background. If you're not an IT expert, then you don't need a home server and you can ignore everything I just said. I very strongly stand by my choice to use Home Assistant as my smart home brain. Home Assistant is an open source smart home platform that works with almost every smart home device under the sun, including solar panels. I run Home Assistant on my home server, but you can just as easily run it on a Raspberry Pi or an old PC or laptop, and they even make their own Home Assistant smart home hubs these days. This Home Assistant Green is a small computer that comes pre-installed with Home Assistant, and it only costs 100 US dollars. This is by far the easiest way to get started with Home Assistant in 2024. Every single automation that you see on my channel is powered by Home Assistant, and it's one of the most flexible and powerful ways to build any smart home. Even Paul Hibbert agrees with me on this one. For the smart devices themselves, I've tried to stick with Zigbee or Wi-Fi devices. I previously shied away from Wi-Fi smart home devices because they have a habit of chewing up network bandwidth and potentially increasing the risk of my network getting hacked. But my earlier decisions to install Unify access points and a Dream Machine mean I'm able to handle hundreds or even thousands of Wi-Fi clients and I can restrict my smart devices to use their own virtual network that can't access any of my personal devices or the internet. I still think that Zigbee is a solid choice, and I'm happy that I use it as my main smart home protocol. There are literally thousands of smart devices that are Zigbee compatible, they're locally controlled so they continue to function normally if my Wi-Fi or internet connection goes down, and it's a solid, reliable mesh network designed for smart homes. 
A lot of people told me I was an idiot for using an old protocol like Zigbee for my smart home, and that I should focus on matter and thread devices instead. But here we are, a year and a half later, and there are still only a handful of matter devices that work properly, and who knows what the heck is going on with thread. Home Assistant supports both matter and thread devices already, so I could easily move to this if I wanted to, or slowly introduce these devices into my ecosystem without taking away from the Zigbee devices I already have. I did, however, make a MASSIVE mistake with my own Zigbee network setup. This made my smart devices really unreliable at times, and it took me almost two months to figure out what was going wrong. It drove my partner and I crazy, and at some point I was ready to pack it in and move to something totally different like Z-Wave or Wi-Fi. Spoiler alert, it was entirely my fault for ignoring my own advice and not reading the instructions properly. I managed to fix that up a couple of months ago by spending $30 on new hardware and rereading my own blog post. Now my Zigbee network is back to being as rock solid as it was in the early days. This epic Zigbee fail is quite a big topic to cover, so I'll be making a separate video all about what I did wrong, how I figured out what the problem was, and how I fixed it. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you want to know when that video has been released. It's quite the journey. It's actually quite lucky that I solved the problem, because I invested over a thousand dollars into replacing my dumb light switches with a combination of Akara and Candeo Dimmer Zigbee smart light switches. I bought a dozen or so different smart switches in the early days, and did a side-by-side -side comparison before I decided on the ones I wanted in my house. You can find a video of this comparison on my channel, and I'm still really happy with the choices I made. These two models have been almost flawless since I installed them. The Kangdeos, though, do have an annoying habit of not rejoining the Zigbee network after a power outage, so I need to repair them manually if the power cuts out. This happened quite a lot in the early days as the electricians had to turn off certain power circuits during the renovations, and this repairing annoyed the shit out of me. Since the works are all done though, we've had one mains power outage and for some reason the switches didn't have any problems after that one. Maybe it's got something to do with the fact that the power was only out for a few minutes rather than the hours that it was during the renovations, I don't know, but that's the only fault I can call out on those. The Akara switches have behaved wonderfully and been absolutely solid. The only thing I don't like about them is the clicking sound they make when they turn on and off. I was hoping to get more used to it, but I'd really much prefer them to be silent. It's not a problem per se, it's just a little bit annoying. Both of these switches could be more visually appealing, mind you. They look a bit utilitarian. But I don't aspire to live in a designer house, and when you put them next to a normal UK light switch, they're actually downright beautiful. I could have probably bought some really nice looking switches and used something like a Shelly relay behind them to get both a nice looking switch and smart features, but the OCD within me hates when the lights are on and the switch looks like it's in the off position. There's also not really enough physical space in a standard UK electrical back box to fit a light switch, a bunch of wires, and a smart relay, so that was off the table for me from day one. I do use a bunch of Shelly relays to do power monitoring and to turn on and off things in my house that aren't light switches, and they're really great. The local Byte smart plugs that I use for monitoring energy consumption of end devices are great too. I used to use Zigbee smart plugs with energy monitoring, but I found that they were really chatty on the network and flooded the already limited bandwidth with noise, so I switched to these Wi-Fi based ones. In hindsight, I should have put a Shelly energy monitoring CT clamp around each of the power ring circuits in my house to help me more easily nail down anything that was using a lot of power. By monitoring the whole circuit, I could at least narrow down which room or area high consumption devices lived in, and that would have helped me bring my baseload power down even more. But on the whole, despite all the flack I got in the comments of my energy efficiency video, I've been quite successful in using these devices, home assistant, and some common sense to reduce the energy usage of my house, and I'm really happy with that. Having smart heating and cooling systems has also helped me optimize my energy usage. The heat miser heating system that just happened to come with the house ticks all the boxes. It can be locally controlled by Home Assistant with the HomeKit device integration, and it has been really easy to set up and integrate. The Daikin air conditioners that I had installed are great devices, but their Home Assistant integration has been a little bit of a mixed bag. I have had to use a fork of a Hacks integration to get them working properly in Home Assistant, and they rely on internet connectivity and the cloud to work in a smart way. I do really enjoy that I don't have to use these giant old school remote controls to cool my house in summer, and can instead use buttons on my control panels and automations via Home Assistant. I don't really know of any smart split system air conditioners that work locally with Home Assistant, and honestly I was more interested in getting a decent, energy efficient, reliable air conditioning system installed in my house than I was in its smart home capabilities. They've been really reliable and great for the five days a year that it's needed over a London summer, and I have no regrets at all about getting them. I do, however, regret my smart blinds. To be fair, there's nothing wrong with the Zemi smart blind motors that I bought, 
they're Zigbee based, they hide inside the roller blind tube so you don't see them, and they've been extremely reliable until the battery in them goes flat. I have three blinds here and they all have the same motors in them and they all go up and down at the same time. But inevitably the battery in just one of them, any one of them, not always the same one, will go flat and I have to drag out these really long USB-C charging cables and charge them up. What's worse is that they don't report their battery levels into Zigbee Do MQTT or ZHA, so it's always unexpected when it happens and there's nothing I can do to predict it. If I had my time again, I'd try and get the electricians to wire up some power to the top of the window frames so I could get a hardwired equivalent. But alas, that's going to be too expensive to do now that I've already patched up all the holes and got the decorators in. In some rooms, where the windows are close to a power outlet, I've jerry-rigged up a bunch of USB-C cables and USB hubs behind the blinds, which are sort of hidden in some trunking, and then snake their way to an old mobile phone charger on a smart plug. This smart plug is then connected to a home assistant automation that runs on a schedule to charge the blinds for an hour twice a week. I've picked these times to be during the day, when the sun is shining and we're probably generating some solar energy, and when we're awake. The automation also only runs if we're home, because charging batteries has been known to occasionally cause fires. The blinds really don't need to be charged all that much, and I want us to be home and awake when it happens, just in case something bad happens. But not all my windows are near a power outlet, so occasionally I need to drag around this battery pack to charge the ones that are out of reach. Semi-Smart also don't make a solar panel attachment for this particular blind, which is annoying because I think it would be a great solution to the problem, and it's something that they do for other models. I've actually been trying to move away from battery-powered devices entirely where I can. Replacing batteries is annoying and it's bad for the environment, so I'm trying to make things a little bit more permanent and hands-off. A lot of my Akara and Sonoff Zigbee motion sensors have been replaced with Everything Presence Ones and Everything Present Lights. I put these on top of bookshelves, plugged into a USB power source, or up high on cupboards where I can power them off the same 5 volt power supply that I use for my addressable WLED strips. The benefit of this is that I get both PIR sensors to turn the lights on instantly when someone walks into a room, and millimeter wave sensors to keep the lights on whilst we sit around in there. These work so much better than the Akara FP1 sensors that I used to have, and I've pulled all of those out of my home now. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the Akara and Sonoff Zigbee motion sensors, and I still use a bunch of them in places that I can't get 5 volt power to, like on the ceiling of my hallways and in the stairwells, and underneath my bathroom cabinets. With all these present sensors, I honestly can't remember the last time I physically used a light switch in my house. My light automations have undergone some tweaks over the year, for example making them turn on different scenes based on the time of day so we have bright lights on when it makes sense and dimmer lights on late at night, but they're all still pretty much the same as the early days and they've been very reliable. I was talking to some smart home colleagues the other day and we all agreed that automated lights are the killer feature of a smart home. It's the automation that you probably use most frequently, and it becomes unnoticeable until one day it stops working. It really is indistinguishable from magic sometimes, and it's the first thing I miss when I stay in a hotel or at somebody else's house. When it comes to smart lights, I still, once again, just like Paul Hibbert, highly recommend Philips Hue lighting products. Sure, they're more expensive than the competitors, but they are really well made. I'm still using Hue lights that I bought six or seven years ago, and they're flawless. They dim much more consistently and smoothly than any other light strip or bulb that I've used and they work brilliantly with Home Assistant. Some of my light strips have been replaced with individually addressable LED strips powered by WLED, but that's mainly so I can do light-based effects and notifications and because I think it's cool. WLED dimming isn't as nice or smooth as Hue's though, so I will keep using Hue strips for my underbed lights and anywhere else that I use strips for pathway or night lights. Whilst we're on the topic of the bedroom, I'm still in love with my Tuya T6E wall panels which I've hacked to run Home Assistant dashboards. My partner and I use these every single day to control the lights, blinds, heating and cooling in our bedroom, and it really feels like we're living in a fancy 5 star Vegas hotel. I also have one of these in the dining room, near the dining table, to set the mood lighting when we eat, and to control the audio and temperature in there. My only regret is not buying more of them. I've heard reports that they're no longer so easy to hack apart and use in the way that I am. I've heard some people being successful and others haven't, so I personally have no idea what the current situation is with them, and I don't want to spend over a hundred bucks on one to find out that I can't use it how I want to. I still have no idea how long these will continue to work, as they're running a version of Android that isn't going to get updated, and probably won't be supported for many more years. But in the meantime, I'm very happy with them, and would definitely look to find an alternative once these are no longer viable. 
Our bed has these pressure mat bed sensors under it, which I use to trigger automations like activating night mode or controlling the blinds. I have mixed feelings about these as they're really useful and I get a lot of value from them, but they only work accurately about 95% of the time. Sometimes if I remake the bed or after my wife and I are... The mat moves slightly and it no longer registers correctly if the bed is occupied or not. Lewis from Everything Smart Home has this elaborate system where the bed weighs whatever's on it and infers who's in there or not, but my partner adamantly stated that she did not want the house to know how heavy she is. Awkward. I'm going to look into using a force sensitive resistor taped to the slats on the bed to figure out if someone is in there or not. But this is one of those projects that I bought all of the parts for and then learned how much soldering, math and electronics learning I'd need to do and put it off for a rainy day. I'll get around to it eventually, so make sure you're subscribed if that's something you want to see me learn. And I think that about covers everything I've done in my smart home so far. On the whole, I've been happy with most of the decisions that I've made, but I'm not done automating this house just yet. What did you all think of this roundup? Was it useful? Any comments or suggestions? Let me know below. I've learned so much and made so many tweaks to the things in my house based on your comments on my videos. I find most of them really useful and I try to read every single one of them. Even the ones where people make fun of my Adam's apple or call me woke for saying partner instead of wife. And whilst you're down there writing a comment, please subscribe to the channel if you like this sort of video. If you're feeling particularly generous, you could give me a super thanks or a PayPal donation, which helps me fund the experiments that I do on this channel and tinker with new automations so we can all learn. As I said, I'm not done automating my house just yet, and I'll be releasing many more videos about my journey. By subscribing to the channel, you'll know when I've released a new video, and then together we can make your home smarter.